This evening, uh, the topic is the many paths of water in the critical zone, and we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Tom Meixner. He is a professor and the associate department head and the director of graduate studies in the Department of Hydrology and Water Resources at U of A, and he studies the intersection of hydrology and biogeochemistry. And soon you'll be able to ask him questions about what that looks like. But please give a warm round of applause for Dr. Tom Meixner. Uh, thank you all for coming. As Super noted, I'll be talking about water in the critical zone today. And as I was preparing this, I realized that one of the things we're doing in our critical zone observatory here in Arizona and in New Mexico is trying to think like a mountain, which is uh, from an old Aldo Leopold essay. And so in the southwest, we know that we're at a place of significant population change, at least in the past. We'll see what the future holds. The future is always unknown. Um, but one of the things we've, we've projected for future climate is that this region of the country is also going to get significantly drier with projected climate change from increased CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. Now, while that's the case, we, we need to understand then how our mountain systems are going to respond to that. And so this is an old schematic showing sort of where our water comes from in the desert basins like the one we live here in Tucson, right? We get snow and significantly more rain in the mountains, and that water either percolates through the mountain itself, through the mountain block, and then out into the basin here where we have Tucson water has the groundwater wells, um, or that water runs out in streams like Sabino Creek and then um, seeps into the earth um, as it comes out into the basin. Um, and then we can also have water that seeps in through the various washes and, and arroyos that dot the basin. Not much recharge comes from that, but some. And then in some areas of the southwest, not here in Tucson, um, water can also just uh, accumulate enough in the soil zone to also percolate just vertically down through what we call basin floor recharge. But for the most part, I'm going to be talking about the mountain systems in New Mexico today to sort of because they're the system we've studied best so far um, to understand where that water, where our water is coming from. And so just a little bit of background. I know some of you were here last month for John Chorover and the critical zone. But the concept of the critical zone is that we have this living skin of the earth where plants are growing and dying, and decomposing. Um, and those plants are growing because of the influx of solar radiation. Right? The sun is what drives plant growth. But those plants also need water. Um, with water, they'll fix carbon. And that carbon then is sort of just like fossil fuels is condensed sunshine that can then do chemical work um, in the critical zone to transform uh, rocks, you know, rock into clay. There's an old New Yorker article where a man stands in front of a mountain and says, someday, son, this will all be clay. Um, so that process of turning rock into clay is one of the key things that happens in the critical zone, and it's what develops our soils, okay? Um, but with developing the soils, there's also what, we, what we've, we call dissipative products. That energy from the sun, the water, the, the chemical weathering products need to be dissipated somehow and exported. And they, that comes in the form of sediment erosion, the release of gases from vegetation, um, and the chemical weathering and the, the removal of, of minerals from the earth. Okay. Um, in our critical zone observatory, we have two sites um, that I'll get to the details in, in a second. But what we're looking at is how does the variability in climate? So warm, rainy summers, dry portions of summer, cold, wet winters, snowy winters. How does that interact with lithology? So the rocks, the, the granite or the gneiss or the sedimentary rocks, or in the case of New Mexico, um, a volcanic dome of rhyolite, but different types of rocks. How do they interact with the climate to create the soils? Um, and importantly, the hydrologic events. So the storm response, the recharge that, that we you receive as services. And how does that happen on short time scales and then on long time scales? Why do we end up with the landforms we have? One of my colleagues, John Pelletier, is very interested in why the Santa Catalinas are highly incised, have very, very steep canyons that rise almost up to the ridge, whereas the Valles Caldera in New Mexico we're working is much more rounded and, and arranged. And there's a role of climate in that, a role of vegetation, and there's a role of that lithology. Okay. So our CZO, our Critical Zone Observatory, is really located in two places. One is the Jemez River Basin in northern New Mexico. Also, it's, also, it's within the, what's called the Valles Caldera National Preserve, which is now part of the National Park Service. Um, 
And then the other one is here in the Santa Catalina Mountains. Um, and both places work off of prior National Science Foundation investments. In the case of the Jemez River Basin, um, there was a science technology center here at the U of A focused on semi-arid hydrology um, called SARA. And then here in the Santa Catalinas, some previous efforts by NSF through, through the Critical Zone Environmental Network, CZEN. Um, and also, um, there's the, a University of Arizona program called Water Sustainability Program that's funded by sales tax dollars. So back in 2000, the voters of the state voted for an increase in the sales tax to go to K-12 education, but also research infrastructure. And so some of that money went to sort of start some of the sites that we've used in the Santa Catalinas. Okay. So our overall design of our, our CZO then is designed on this, on the ability to use elevational gradients, right? Down here in Tucson, up near Biosphere 2, it's relatively hot and dry. We have a traditional Sonoran Desert climate. As you go up in elevation, you go to Oak Woodland, Pinion Juniper, Ponderosa Pine. And as we shift over to New Mexico, and one of the reasons we do that is we get up to very high elevations, 3,100 meters at the top of Redondo Peak in the Valle, um, and you get to mixed conifer forests. The Valle is sort of the southernmost extension of the Rocky Mountain ecosystems. Um, and so you have very, very big snowpacks during the winter, um, a mixed conifer forest. And so these are all the sites we've worked at. We're still planning to do install one more site in the, the Valle in um, New Mexico. But the advantage of this, this sort of transect of sites then is we go from very low, you know, sites with very little precipitation up at Biosphere 2, you know, barely 40 centimeters of rain um, near Biosphere 2, up to 8 tenths of a, a meter up at the, the high elevations in, in New Mexico. And we also go from mean annual temperatures near the biosphere of about 20 degrees C down to only 3 degrees Celsius as the mean annual temperature. So we have quite a change in climate and precipitation. Um, and we're able to use that to then understand, okay, how do ecosystems, how do soils, how does the hydrology shift as you go from warm to, you know, warm to cool and dry to wet? Okay. So the rest of my talk is going to focus on that Vias caldera. Okay and a series of watersheds that we've studied that go sort of in various aspects around the Redondo Dome, the resurgent dome of the volcano in the Valles Caldera. And you know, so we have east-facing watersheds, north-facing watersheds, and west-facing watersheds. And if you, you, you know, right in the morning you wake up, the sun hits your house in the summer, it's hot on that side of the house, but it's still a cool morning. In the afternoon, if you have a west-facing house like I do, the front of your house gets really hot unless you have some shade um, to protect it from that sun. And then the south-facing slopes of the Catalinas, if you compare south versus north-facing, the south-facing slopes are a lot drier. And so we're using this transect to look at the variable inputs of solar radiation, okay? Hotter and drier on the south-facing slopes, cooler and wetter on the north-facing slopes. And looking at how over time, the three million years since this dome was in place, how the soils have developed and how the soils development has changed the hydrologic response and how much water these places can hold and for how long. Okay. And so one other advantage we have working in the southwest, um, at least scientifically, is the highly variable climate we have. So, you know, this is some older data we have, but you go from years like 2007, 8, and 9, where there was almost 800 millimeters, um, you know, 80 centimeters, almost a meter, so about three feet of precipitation, um, down to years like um, 2010 and 2011 where there was only 550 millimeters. So we have this highly variable climate. Sometimes it's very wet, sometimes it's very dry. Sometimes the summer, like in 09 and 10, is very wet, whereas the winter is very dry. And so we're able to use that variability in precipitation both seasonally and between years to sort of understand how is this system responding to wetter versus drier conditions and in different seasons? Okay. So one of the fundamental tools we have in hydrology is what we call the water balance, right? Rain falls from the sky, and a fundamental question hydrologists then have is, well, where does that water go? How much of it goes back to the atmosphere in evapotranspiration, either just from bare ground evaporation from puddles and wet soil, or through transpiration, through the growth of plants and the release of, of moisture back to the atmosphere. And whatever doesn't go back to the atmosphere can then either represent a change in water storage, so an increase in groundwater, so a groundwater recharge, or it can be discharged in streams. 
And so if you go back to that diagram I had of mountain block versus mountain front recharge, this change in storage is mountain block. This runoff that comes out of the mountains could potentially be transformed into mountain front recharge or alternatively go into reservoirs and supply water for us. Okay. So we can look at this water balance across that set of watersheds going from east to more north facing and more southerly facing watersheds and look at how the input of water differs. The input of water is pretty similar. These places aren't that different in terms of how much water falls from the sky into them. They're similar elevation, similar location. Okay. But they do differ a little bit at least in their annual evapotranspiration. But similarly, the ET is pretty similar. They're all vegetated. They're all photosynthesizing. They're all releasing moisture back to the sky. Um, but there are differences between years and precipitation. And I don't know if you noticed, the trees are pretty consistent. They're always evapotranspiring about 550 millimeters of rain of precipitation. And so while precipitation changes, the ET isn't. Now what this has a result in doing is then is a change in where that water goes. Okay. In the wetter years, okay, you get more runoff, which is what's shown here in terms of millimeters per year of runoff. Um, and also notably here now, we're starting to see differences across these four watersheds. Okay. In the driest year, 2010 and 2011, none of them are discharging that much water. Okay. In the wettest year, though, there's quite a difference in, in process. And the more northern facing History Grove, Upper Jaramillo, and Upper Redondo watersheds are discharging more water. Okay. And so there's a difference now in that effect of are these southerly facing or northerly facing watersheds. And if we take the residual, so we had the rain, we had how much water went back to the sky in ET, how much ran off into the streams, we can look at the annual change in storage at the catchment scale. And again, we see a different story, and particularly we see different stories in aspect. It seems that that Lahara catchment is storing a lot of water. Um, one problem with this is that right, rainfall we can measure pretty accurately, discharge we can measure pretty accurately, ET remains as a residual source, uh, we, we can estimate it, but our estimates are only so good. But we, we again are seeing some variability across these watersheds, particularly in that those more northerly facing watersheds, in that driest year, we're getting more water, we're basically getting more stream flow than we would have expected based on how much ET and rainfall we had in that most northerly facing watershed. But in the southerly facing watersheds, there's less of a difference. Okay, and And so if you will, a conclusion we're starting to draw then is that from these results, we're hypothesizing that more northerly facing places have deeper soils and more water storage um, and can store more water overall. But we're going to look at that with some other data to see what's going on. Now, what we were looking there was annual scale data. There's also a difference in these watersheds in how the annual hydrograph, how the stream flow looks over time during the year. So again, we're looking at that same 07 to 2011 period. Um, you know, we have drier years like 07, 08, where there's not much runoff, but notably those middle watersheds that have a more northerly facing um, aspect, and a little bit wetter as we've hypothesized, have a, still have a fairly robust amount of stream flow at History Grove and Upper Jaramillo. But there are much wetter years like 09 and 10, and then desperately dry years like 10 and 11. One thing you'll notice from these, what you typically see is sort of this annual cycle. A lot of stream flow in April and May, okay, and not much the rest of the year. And despite the Valle having rough, getting roughly 50% of its precipitation during the summer and 50% in the winter, you really don't see a, re a stream flow response from that summer monsoon season. And that's fairly typical in mountain systems across the southwest. We do get summer rains but there's a lot less stream flow that gets generated from them. With the summer monsoon, largely rain falls from the sky, it fills up the soil, and it goes right back to the sky in the trees, from the trees transpiring it back to the sky. Um, some years are different. You know, There's been two years in Salt River Projects, 120 year records, where they've gotten more, more flow into the reservoirs in the summer than in the winter. Mostly that has to do with the fact that those are summers that followed insanely dry winters. Um, 
So you have this annual response that's largely associated with snowmelt, right? It's not raining and snowing a lot in April and May in northern New Mexico, but what's happening is all that snow that built up during the winter is being melted and released back into the streams. Okay. And we can look at that in still another way. Okay. So we can look at that response and go, oh, that's probably snow. But uh, the waters of the Earth have, um, water has an isotopic signature. And what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the delta 18 of oxygen. So oxygen, a as an element, has multiple isotopes. The most common oxygen has an has a atomic mass of 16. Less common isotopes, oxygen 17 and 18, we can look at the ratio of that heavier isotope to the lighter isotope. And you can essentially interpret this y-axis as a thermometer. Less negative values are from warmer rain events and warmer evaporation sources. More negative values are for colder temperatures. Okay. So if you will, simplistically, your monsoon rain has an isotopic composition that's up here, and snow has an isotopic composition down here. When we look at the various stream and spring and groundwater samples that we've collected in the Valle Caldera, what we see is that those samples all overlap with snow. Okay. So all the water we're seeing in the streams, for the most part, is from snow. Those summer rains, they happen. They certainly affect the system, but we don't see them in the streams and groundwater. Okay. And another way we can sort of look at this problem is we can look at what's the chemical composition of different types of water that we can sample in this system. So we can sample precipitation, we can sample shallow groundwater, and deep groundwater. And each of those have different amounts of chloride, okay, just like sodium chloride, but just the chloride, and silica essentially the dissolved pieces of rock. And so not surprisingly, deep groundwater, probably been around a while, has a higher silica concentration. It's been in contact with the rocks longer. Um, the shallow groundwater, because it's rainwater that's been allowed to evaporate and transpire, has a higher chloride concentration. And so we can say, okay, precip is here, shallow groundwater is here, um, deep groundwater is there, and we can do some geometry or some linear algebra. Um, Shippard was saying math is fun. So we can do some geometry and linear algebra and say, okay, this stream water that we see here is, you know, 30% deep groundwater, 50% shallow groundwater, and 10% precipitation. Okay. So we can take that, that geometry and do it over time for the stream water for our different locations. And one of the things we see consistently across all the watersheds we've looked at in the Valles Caldera is that this deep groundwater source is far and away the most significant source of water we see in the stream. And what's particularly sort of not terribly intuitive is that even during that snowmelt pulse that we have in the spring, when you might say, oh, the snow's melting, the streams, there's more water in the stream, that water in the stream must be the snowmelt. Well, it's caused by the snowmelt, but it's not the snowmelt itself. It's still water that's been in contact with the ground and from this deep groundwater source for a significant period of time. So sort of the illusion of, oh, this, it rains or, or the snow is melting, that must be what's causing the stream to rise. That's right, but the water in the stream is water that's been in the earth for some significant period of time. Okay. And so from there we then think, so so far we've just said, well, the water came from the deep groundwater. But how long was it there? Okay, and we've, we've approached this problem with a couple of different tools. Um, one of them was some work by a, a, a master student, Patrick Broxton, looking at essentially the transit time. How long does it take from the moment a, a, some snow melts or rain falls from the sky till we see it in the stream? And what you're looking at here now on the y-axis is that um, mean transit time. Okay, and this pay less attention to this, but this is how he's calculated the mean transit time. He's looking at the variability of that isotopic composition in the stream. Okay. But essentially, higher up is longer transit times, lower down is shorter transit times, and then from left to right here, we're going from southerly aspects, so the sign of the angle, right, we can create a wind rose that goes starting with an angle of zero at, the, at north. Um, but a, a, a negative sign of one is south facing, a sign, of, a, a sign value of one for that angle is north facing, 
So as we go from south facing to north facing, what we're seeing is longer and longer mean transit times. So it's taking the water longer to get from when it falls from the sky to when we see it in the stream on those north aspects. Probably implying that those are deeper soils and a deeper hydrologic system because it took longer to get from point A to point B. Okay. Another way we have do, of, of calculating that residence time is using tritium. So tritium is an isotope of hydrogen. Okay. So hydrogen is simply a proton. Deuterium is a hydrogen is a proton and a neutron in the nucleus, and a tritium is a proton and two neutrons. Importantly, tritium is then radiogenic. It's a radioactive element. It has a half-life of about 12.3 years. Okay. So if we look at the tritium composition of rain, and then we look at the tritium composition of our groundwater, we can say, okay, the tritium composition of our groundwater is half of what it was in the rain, and therefore it took water an, a certain amount of time in age here to get from point A to point B. Okay. And so as we're going here, from south to north again, we're going from younger to older waters here in red. The bottom line is then from this tritium data calculating an age. So we're going from younger waters on the south to older waters on the north. Very different time frame for these calculations. They're showing the water is very old. The mean transit times before were in days. These are now in years. So that water we're seeing on the north facing aspects is 10 years old. But again, Five versus 10 years old, five on south, 10 on north, telling us deeper soils on the north facing slopes. Okay. And so we can take this data now together and develop a conceptual model of how this place works. How does this mountain work in transforming rainfall and precipitation into vegetation and growth and evapotranspiration um, and into recharge and runoff? And what the conceptual model we develop is that the south-facing slopes are drier. They're getting more solar radiation, about 30% more. Okay. Um, the north-facing slopes are getting less sunlight, slightly shorter growing seasons, and as a result, slightly less evapotranspiration. They also have, end up having slightly deeper soils. We've debated in our group what the cause of this is, but one explanation is that because that place is wetter, and it's been wetter for thousands and millions of years, the soils have developed deeper depths. Those deeper soils are then creating that longer transit time we see from the, the south versus north facing slopes. Okay. So this is one conceptual approach. Another way to look at this too is to sort of go from south to north facing years and think about wet versus dry years and how the mountain, how does the mountain fill up with water and how does it release it? And that model has to account for the fact that whenever we're looking at this system, what we're seeing in the stream is snow, so it's recharge that happened in the spring snowmelt period, and it's water that propagated all the way down into the deep groundwater system. And so the sort of the, the way we've thought about it is the mountain fills up with water, okay, and as it's filling up with water, that deep groundwater is getting pushed out. Okay, and then as it dries out, that water then pushes down, and that what was shallow groundwater will become deep groundwater. So we've seen sort of this, this information that, yeah, the, the water comes from the mountains, but there are different ways in which that water gets processed on south versus north facing slopes. Um, and for example, in the face of climate change, these north facing slopes with deeper soils, longer residence times might be more resilient in the face of a hotter, drier world that we're forecasting for this part of the world. Okay. And with that, I'll finish and I'll take your questions and just the picture of all the people who've, uh, the, you know, it's a very big project. There's, you know, 30, 40 people working on it at any one time, and particularly the students cycle out. So, but thank you very much. <laughs>